Welcome to this Union Solidarity International web conference with the, the esteemed Professor James Galbraith. Professor Galbraith, it's a real honour for us to be able to have a short conversation with you today regarding the global economy, but particular the crisis within America and the Eurozone, and to get your expert, expert analysis and some remedies of how you think we can find our way out of the economic crisis that we're in at the moment. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Excellent. I would like you just to, to start the conversation, Professor Galbraith, as someone who's read a lot of your work and I know you have written extensively about pay inequality, particularly within the United States of America, and indeed wrote a book titled Created on Un- created unequal, the crisis in American pay. Can you give Union Solidarity International your analysis of where we are regarding the crisis in pay in America and some potential solutions? I know you've suggested a higher minimum wage, for example. Well, indeed I have. Um, The virtue of a higher minimum wage is that uh, it tends to transform conditions, working conditions at the low end of the wage spectrum, uh, and it uh, restores the purchasing power of the part of the population that has had been hit very hard by the financial crisis. Uh, so I think that it has a, a, a great deal to recommend it, particularly in a political climate in the United States where it is practically impossible uh, uh, to um, get any new legislation that involves a direct government spending. Uh, one feature of the minimum wage is that since we have a, a payroll tax that uh, uh, is attached to the Social Security and Medicare programs in this country, a higher minimum wage means higher payments on the, in, on the payroll tax, and uh, that in, in fact would uh, strengthen the uh, political position of the most important uh, social insurance programs that we have in the country. So it's part of a strategy uh, to uh, let's say, uh, counter the forces of austerity with a policy of solidarity uh, and mutual support, uh, n- not intended to uh, create to achieve economic miracles, but intended to, intended to help ensure that those who have been hard, hit hardest by the crisis um, uh, are, are protected and supported uh, during this uh, very difficult time. Indeed. And, you know, we see a policy all over the world in actual fact about pay restraint and actually the dilution of terms and conditions, the dilution of collective bargaining rights. We see that most prominently in America. Why do you think there is a failure of policymakers at all levels to recognise the need for a higher minimum wage and actually how collective bargaining and stronger collective bargaining is a function of a strong and healthy economy. Well, collective bargaining in the U.S. Uh, at its zenith was a, uh, a feature of, of the industrial uh, union system uh, at a time when manufacturing was a much larger share of the of the U.S. economy than it is now. And we've seen a, a, a decline in private sector collective bargaining uh, as a consequence of, you know, largely of the of, of the uh, of the decline in the manufacturing sector, which has been going on since the 1980s, um, it, the second phase of that has been, and most recently in the public se- sector, an attack on the unions that uh, uh, provide whose workers provide public services, particularly education, public education. Uh, we've had the deunionization actually in the. Uh, uh, education sector in uh, the state of Wisconsin recently. These are things which are, um, they are largely uh, political in character. They are intended uh, to weaken a political force, which uh, uh, the incumbent state administrations uh, happen to oppose. Uh, what the minimum wage does, it, it does not per se um, uh, su- support uh collective bargaining, it may help that indirectly, but what it does, of course, is to uh, uh, provide a floor set by law 
which uh, reaches out to a great many workers who are uh, not touched by unionization at all and who work in, under circumstances where it would be very difficult uh, to be uh, effectively unionized. We have a situation, for example, in the state of Texas where the median wage in construction has fallen to about $10 an hour. And that is fundamentally a matter of having a very fragmented industry where uh, construction workers basically are, 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 are on their own. If you raise the minimum wage, then you would uh, not only provide a much more uh, suitable floor for, the, for, for wage payments in that industry, but you would also give the workers in that industry uh, additional capacity to, uh, to assert and defend their interests. Thanks for that fantastic response and the, the essential need to have trade unions as part of a, a healthy economy and how it can be good for the economy. And I would like just to move on, if you don't mind, Professor Galbraith, to talk about a very topical issue at the moment, of course, the, the fiscal deficit, the, the, the so-called fiscal cliffs. And we hear extensively drip drip in the media about the dangers of the fiscal deficit in particular how higher interest rates are supposed to be associated with a higher fiscal deficit and i know that you have tried to take on this argument to say that there's very little evidence i understand about how fiscal deficit actually leads to higher interest rates could you just flesh this out a little bit more about what is the dangers of the fiscal deficit? Because as we as we know that sometimes actually investing more in the times of crisis can actually be more healthy for the, the economy in the medium term. Well, perhaps you can help me out a little bit. What is the interest rate right now on long-term UK government bonds? Uh, well, I think it's about... What is it? Three percent, something like that. As well as well. That itself, I think, speaks volumes to this question of whether fiscal deficits, per se, are a risk for higher interest rates. We have a situation in the United States where we have all of this uh, uh, weeping and moaning, hysterical uh, talk about the dangers of the deficit, and people with money, people with real money, big money, are willing to lend to the United States government for 20 years for three percent three percent what does that tell you <laughs> exactly it tells you that the people who are uh, engaging in this uh, extraordinary melodrama about the deficits uh, do not know what they are talking about and do not speak for people who have institutions banks uh, that have real money uh, that they wish to commit at this point and anybody who listened, I mean, we had this discussion uh, uh, a, a few years ago where the very serious uh, uh, senior political people, uh, the, the former chief of staff in the Clinton White House, Erskine Bowles, and former Republican senator from Wyoming, Alan Simpson, got together, were designated a commission, uh, and they were going about warning that if we didn't cut deficits, which is just basically a euphemism for cutting Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, that we didn't... Uh, eviscerate the core social insurance programs in the country that within a couple of years we would have a major financial crisis. That was a couple of years ago uh, and guess what? The US government interest rates haven't gone up. Indeed someone who bought US government bonds on the, uh, uh, on the contrarian assumption that Mr. Bowles and Mr. Simpson didn't know what they were talking about would have and people did uh, enjoy very large capital gains uh, because the price of the bond goes up when the interest rate goes down and what happened was and ha has happened so far is that those long-term interest rates have gone down so on, on just on the most elementary evidence and one could one can make a more elaborate argument as to why this is the case but on the most elementary evidence it's clear that we are facing a wall of nonsense on the question of deficits and debt, a wall of hysteria that fails to distinguish between the cases of countries which are uh, have a sovereign control over their currency, uh, and that includes the U.S., it certainly includes the U.K., it includes Japan, and countries which do not and for which there are real dangers that they may be forced into default 
uh, on their debt, real dangers that their debt will be restructured, in some cases already has been, inflicting losses on bondholders. And that is the situation, of course, facing the peripheral countries of Europe, who are in a very different position uh, than uh, countries outside the Eurozone, than, than the industrial, wealthy industrial countries outside the Eurozone are. Thanks for that fantastic response once again. And I'm interested to delve a little bit deeper into why you think this wall of nonsense has been able to penetrate not only the upper echelons of political and financial institutions, but seems to have penetrated actually working families the length and breadth of the country. Yeah, I don't know that that's the case. I, I, I think most people have a common sense view in this country, they understand that they um, have a, a budget constraints, that a, an individual household has to stay within its means most of the time, uh, but they also understand that the core social insurance programs uh, are important bulwarks of uh, the stability and security of their lives. And so I don't, I don't think that there is a, uh, I don't think that the, that the deficit drones have uh, had a large impact out on uh, the, the population. And in fact, in fact, I'm sure that polls of, of what economic concern uh, is most important uh, generally don't show the deficit uh, at being very highly ranked unless people are prompted, in which case, of course, they will say, oh, yes, they've heard that the deficit is a bad thing. But, you know, I, so I, the real question is, why has this got such a grip on the policy discussion, and Absolutely. why indeed are you and I discussing it rather than discussing important questions like uh, unemployment or mm -hmm. energy or climate change, which are actually going to have a bearing uh, on our um, conditions of life for a uh, in a serious way, whereas this issue doesn't. And the answer to that is that we have been uh, subjected with the. A collaboration of, of, of some parts of the economics profession, I regret to say, uh, to a, a long-standing propaganda campaign. We set up in the 20th century, in the 30s in the United States, in the post-war period in, in Britain and much of the rest of Europe, um, very um, robust systems that had never existed of uh, social insurance, of social protections. Uh, and that includes, of course, the National Health Service in the UK, but in the US, where we never quite covered everybody. Now, I didn't come close to covering everybody for medical care. We did cover the elderly with Medicare. And we covered people below a certain income standard with Medicaid. And we covered veterans and others. Uh, and all of this uh, has created um, a contest for, if you like, market opportunities. Uh, and we have a long standing campaign uh, of. Uh, People allied with the private insurance companies, for example, people allied with uh, fund management companies who would like to manage your uh, uh, manage your your savings and not have a, uh, a social security uh, fund that is uh, uh, providing that basic security, um, and they are relentless in uh, keeping a drumbeat. Of, um, of, of what is essentially propaganda going on these topics. Um, and they, unfortunately, what has built, been built up in the structures of government in the United States and in other countries are, is the habit of putting an enormous emphasis on long-term budget forecasts, budget forecasts which are basically computer projections uh, built on the basis of a certain set of assumptions about the economy. And these two uh, tend to back up the uh, notion that there's some big problem there, but when you examine them, uh, it's fair to say they tend to fall apart because they do not reflect uh, plausible reality for the long-term future in a number of different ways. Thanks very much. I've only got one, one or two quick last questions, Professor Galbraith, because I know your time is precious and actually it brings me on to the point of unemployment, which you referred to in your previous response and the importance of this issue, particularly as we see in Europe, in the Eurozone, where several major nation states now have youth unemployment at fifth, more than 50%, and actually this is a trend that is rising, and we, 
from a European perspective, see little policy solutions that are being brought to the table that could actually address this issue. Is there things from your perspective, investing in infrastructure and targeting money at youth employment, is there potential solutions from your perspective that could be discussed and deserve to have a wider airing than they currently are getting at the moment? Because this is the major crisis facing the European population is unemployment and in particular young people. Well, I mean, we are entirely right that this is the major crisis. Uh, it is something which uh, European policy has been very careful not to address. What the Europeans have done is to create a situation, particularly in recent months, where people are reasonably confident that the financial uh, side of things will not fall apart. But the price of that confidence is that the social side and the economic side, the actual living conditions in a number of countries, if you look at Greece or Spain and increasingly Italy, um, are under extraordinary stress, and that stress is unrelenting. Uh, the first thing you have to do is to relieve that stress, which means you have to reverse some of the policies of social destruction, which are currently being posed, uh, imposed on uh, European countries. You have to recognize this is a road to a kind of social disaster which uh, is ultimately going to destroy Europe if it's, if it, uh, if it's pursued. And in fact, it should ultimately destroy Europe because a European Union which is dedicated to the destruction of previously existing social guarantees is clearly not worth having for most of the European population. So that's the path that they're on. Getting off of it is the key is the key priority. How do you do that? I think the answer to that, I, I do think that the experience of the American New Deal is a useful one here. Uh, and it's worth thinking about carefully what the New Deal actually consisted of. A very important part of it was the enactment of let's say, the social security system in 1935 and the minimum wage in the same year. And what that did for a very large national continental economy that had not had national systems before was that it brought the whole population together and gave them a common floor of, for economic security. Uh, and up to that point, you had, you had whatever home relief was in New York, unemployment insurance that was in Massachusetts or Wisconsin, uh, but that didn't extend to, let's say, Texas or Florida or Alabama. Creating a national system, which is to say a continental system, uh, gave the whole country the capacity to have a much more uh, robust response to economic stress. Now, what Europe actually created during the war, following the war, were a number of national systems that did this quite well, but these are now being submerged in this international uh, economic unit that's called the European Union. Extending those mechanisms of solidarity would, I think, make an important difference. It would make a difference to the unemployment issue. We have um, a number of possibilities here. One is... Uh, already been proposed, I believe, by the European trade unions, which is a Europe-wide system of unemployment insurance funded from Brussels. That would support individuals who are out of work directly. Uh, I have long suggested a European pension union, uh, which would provide a common basis, a common minimum of retirement security across the European Union, bringing up the level in the, some of the poorer countries so that people who have worked long years in those countries do not have to retire on the very meager national uh, uh, national uh, average income. They can retire on the European average income. Uh, another possibility is a popping up scheme along the lines of the earned income tax credit. What these things have in common is that they would uh, Go, reach out from the center of Europe to the citizens of Europe, bypassing national governments, which are in some cases quite stressed and quite unable uh, to effectively impl implement uh, new programs. I mean, it's something that is a real problem with the, let's say, the proposals for 
major investment projects in a country like Greece, you haven't got a government counterparty there that can actually carry them out. But you could set up a, a direct uh, uh, system of, of, of mutual support. This would ease the unemployment problem for young people. I think that uh, there are other ways that you have to think about how to distribute the existing uh, employment opportunities uh, across the European population uh, in order to uh, get away from the problem that you have now, which is that the existing unemployment is so heavily tilted toward young people. Uh, there are, and this is a problem we face in the United States, to a lesser degree, I think we have a larger share of that population in higher education, so they're not counted, they're out of the labor force, they're not counted as unemployed, and they're not they're not uh, competing for jobs that they might otherwise have a hard time getting. Uh, but beyond that, you also have to think about uh, um, the conditions of retirement. Uh, and the fact is, uh, it's much easier for an older person to leave the labor force gracefully than it is for a younger person to struggle looking for a job for five or ten years. And it's so, again, there are reasons to strengthen the mechanisms of social solidarity that would make it much easier to manage the social implications of having a smaller workforce uh, than we have had in the past. And then, of course, the, you know, beyond that, you can ask how do you expand the workforce and work opportunities. But I think it's best to have an intelligent management of the existing very difficult situation. And that is the thing that is most glaringly absent uh, in the European um, economic policy uh, discourse at the moment. Excellent, Professor Galbraith. I think that's a very apt point to, to finish on about how the need uh, to strengthen solidarity between European states and to provide programmes that indeed try to deliver that to address the crisis of unemployment and youth unemployment. Professor Galbraith, I just want to thank you very much indeed for your time with us today to talk to Union Solidarity International and to get your points out to the British and Irish trade union movement about some of the potential solutions that could be brought forward to address the crisis and also to get your expert analysis of the fallacy of the points being made by neoliberals in particular. Thank you very much indeed for joining thank us today, thank Professor Galbraith. Pleasure talking to you.